This is Eric Jackson, and today I have the pleasure of talking with the uh, wonderful, well, I, I never know how to describe Joey. I, the first thought that comes to mind is organist, but he plays organ, he plays uh, piano and keyboards, he plays trumpet, he does uh, some vocal work too, so, well, here's this musician whose name is Joey DeFrancesco, and it's my pleasure <laughs> to talk with Joey today. How you doing, Joey? Oh, great, man. Okay. Good, good to talk to you. Good, good, okay. How do you describe yourself? Since I can't, how do you describe yourself? <laughs> well, I, guess, I guess the best thing, like you said, musician, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really, the organ is uh, my first instrument and the instrument I'm most known for. And then, you know, I, about 20 years ago, I started playing the trumpet. Um, and then I always sang. I was always singing since a little kid. I just didn't do a whole lot of it on record. I have a couple of records where I did, but not, you know, not all of them. And, uh, the piano, too, you know, coming up as a child, I learned how to play some piano, because the piano and organ are very different. Right, right, um, right. But, you know, the organ is my main, I guess, with my main voice, you know? Uh, now, which okay. did you play first, the uh, the piano or the organ? The organ, for the sure. Organ. Okay. I, I had a friend of mine, a cousin actually of mine, who uh, played piano, and then my parents uh, bought an organ into our house, and I remember talking to him about, about playing the organ, and he said, oh man, that thing's a monster, I don't know about that. He did sit down and play it, but he was a little uh, uh, reluctant at first because he said it's such a different instrument than playing the piano that uh, he called it a monster. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, they, they both can be lost. The organ is, uh, the thing about the organ is it's got a lighter touch, but there's all kinds of other things going on, especially when you get involved in playing the jazz organ, you know, because you have, you're have you playing bass lines and you're controlling the expression pedal. There's sounds to deal with. A lot of stuff happening. Right. Uh -huh. I, I looked at your, your Facebook page um, earlier this morning, and I saw that, uh, I guess it was yesterday, was the uh, birthday of uh, the man Hammonds, or was it Lauren Hammonds? Yes, Lauren was, Hammonds. Yeah. Right, right. You celebrated that day, huh? Of course, you know, <laughs> there's a very important guy. And, and the other guy, you know, equally as important as Don Leslie, the inventor of the Leslie Speaker. Right, you know? right, right. Tell, tell us, tell us uh, what the uh, Leslie Speaker is or what it does. Well, the Leslie Speaker is basically, it's the amplifier that connects to the organ, so the sound from the organ comes from this box, big box, and it, it's speakers that put sound to a turning device to make the organ uh, have some motion in its sound, so, and it was originally, uh, the idea was, so you make it sound even more like a pipe organ, you know, how, with the tremolo and things like that. And then, you know, jazz organ has got a hold of it. It was a whole other thing, you know. Yeah. But without that speaker, I don't think the Hammond organ would have been as popular as it became because that's really what woke the sound of the organ up. Yeah. Did, did the original Hammond organ not have the, uh, the Leslie? Yeah, no, it didn't. It first came out, they made their own cabinets. They made these very dull-sounding... Uh, speaker cabinets that came with the organ, you know. And then Don Leslie, the inventor of the Leslie, he was a um, organ player, so he got a hand and, and he didn't like the sound of it. He said, this doesn't sound right, you know. Well, uh -huh. He made his own speaker, and then they were two separate companies, you know. And, and he originally brought his design to Hammond, and they turned him away, man, and, and they were... It was like the enemy for years, but it was hard because everybody that bought a hammer wanted to buy a Leslie speaker with it. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Finally, they got it together. It took about 20 years. Right, right. So now, I guess if you're a jazz organist, you don't even think about getting a Hammond without getting a Leslie? No way. Right. Okay. No way. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you are a third generation musician. That's that's uh, that's great. That's great. Yes, my my grandfather 
uh, who I'm named after, uh-huh. and he he was a Reed fan, so he played um, with a lot of some of the big bands back in the day. Oh, you know, in the okay. 30s and 40s, and uh, he was with the Dorsey Brothers for a short period, and 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 many other different groups, and he was. You know, he was uh, he was a great musician. Like by the time I was born, he wasn't playing as much. He was I remember him pulling his his tenor out and playing it from time to time. But he was pretty much done with playing. But from what people tell me, he was an amazing musician. Really, uh-huh. uh, that could play any instrument. You know, he could pick up an instrument and play it for a few days, a few hours, and be able to play it. You know, uh-huh. he's one of those kind of guys. Did, did he? Ever, then, I'm sorry. I was oh, going to go say, did he ever hear you play professionally? Yeah, he got to hear me play. When I see, when I was born, he was uh, he was about eighty years old. So he he died when he was almost ninety. Yeah. So, but I was playing by then. I was playing when I was five years old, four years old. I could play, and of course, my dad, right, right. John D. Francesco, right. Right. right, right, plays organ. So he was playing gigs in Philly and New Jersey. And I would go sit in with him. So my grandfather did get to hear me play when I was very young. Okay. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's great. And you got a brother that plays too, right? Yeah, my brother John is a—he's a blues guitarist, man, and singer. He's really good too. Did he work with you on one or two of your records? We did one. We did. He was a guest on one of my records. That's right. We also did. We did a record together too, the Francesco Brothers. Oh, right. Years. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. When you ha- and you have worked with your father on uh, on recordings too. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh yeah. We did a few. Yeah, had a few of the fun things we did. Right. Um, did you just sort of just pick up the organ just because uh, I don't know some admiration of your father or you just fall fell in love with the instrument because it, it was around the house? Yeah, I think it was both of those. You know. The, the sounds of the recordings and things that I heard, and that the instrument was there, and yet yeah, my dad playing it definitely was interested. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Just, just uh, another question out of curiosity: Does your mother play an instrument? No, no, no. <laughs> just had to check, <laughs> see how much music was in the family too. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. And I see the next thing you're going to do is you're going back home to play. Well, in a couple of weeks, you're going to be back home playing. That's Philly. right. Hey, man, I'll be, be in the hometown after that. Yeah. That must always be exciting to, to come home. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, and I haven't played in a while. And I, oh, wait a minute. I played there last year. That's right. <laughs> oh, okay. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this to you when we did the live broadcast last year, that there are just so many uh, organ players who have come from out of that uh, area. Uh, mm-hmm. t- could you talk to me about some of the, uh, meeting some of them and, and talking with some of those uh, er, uh, organ players in your early days, in your younger sure, days? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, primarily... Most of it, the, the foundation, you know, of the cats that started playing, you know, Jimmy Smith, first of all. Sure, sure. But even before him, um, Wild Bill Davis was, was oh, sure. uh, you know, he was the first cat that really started that approach on the instrument, you know, and then Jimmy took it and ran with it and did a whole other thing, but... But then Jimmy McGriff is from Philadelphia. Right, right. Uh, Shirley, Shirley Scott. Yeah. You know, Trudy Pitts, uh, Charles Erlen. Charles Erlen was much later, but, you know, he's from Philly too. And, and Don Patterson lived in Philadelphia. He wasn't originally from there. Right, right. But he was a right. Groove Holmes was just across the bridge in Camden. That's my hometown, so yes, yes. You got to mention him. I was going to mention him if you didn't. <laughs> oh no, you got to mention Groove. You know, and what's what the thing is? I think most of that is because of Jimmy Smith being there, you know, and he was playing locally a lot. I mean, the first time Jimmy McGriff heard Jimmy Smith, a lot of people don't know. It was a. Uh, he was playing in Don Gardner organ tree. Oh, sure, right, yeah. Right? Yeah. And they played at Jimmy McGriff's sister's wedding. Oh, really? That's the first time he heard Jimmy Smith. You know, he, he, 
he heard the organ and went nuts over it, you know? Because Jimmy Smith was really from Norristown. Right, right, but, yes, yes. No, but it's, it's right there. Right. You know? uh -huh. You can hear a few minutes for Philly, but so that's and then Groove Home. So all the cats would go hang out, especially when Jimmy got you know in the late fifties is when they, everybody else started wanting to play the instrument. Is what he was doing with it, right? Right. Uh huh. So they were all Shirley Scott. All of them would go go check him out, you know, and say, "Man, what's this? What's that?" So Philadelphia so was, and then my family. Is all from Niagara Falls, New York. Okay. My mother, my father, and then in 1967 they moved to Philadelphia um, for other work that my dad was doing. Uh, so in '71 I was born, and I was born in Philly, man. So I became it's like uh, destiny, you know. Right, right, you know, right. From Philadelphia with the lineage of all the other organ players. <laughs> You know, you were telling us stories about uh, stories about all those organ players. Uh, you mentioned Charles Erlen. Uh, Charles was a saxophone player, and he was playing. I can't remember who it was. He was playing with the song. Jimmy McGriff. Right, right. And he fell in love with the organ that, that, that Jimmy was playing. That's right. Right. <laughs> yeah, he was Jimmy McGriff's saxophone player. Right. 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 Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you didn't mention anything about how your relationship with any of those uh, players. Did you, you know, get a chance very, to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was very fortunate to, to know all of those people that I mentioned. It's amazing. And, I, and when I think about it, how fortunate that I've been. Because, you know, I met Jimmy Smith for the first time when I was eight years old. And... Um, and like, and then of course Trudy Pitts. You know Trudy Pitts, sure, right? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people don't know about Trudy, but Trudy was an amazing. She was a huge influence on me, and she was in the Philadelphia area, and you know we were very close, and you know I spent a lot of time around her. Really, uh -huh. and you know then Jimmy McGriff. I think he lived in Newark, New Jersey at the time. But he used to come to Philly all the time, right? So I met him. And then when I met these people, I, I kept, you know, kind of kept in touch with them. You know, I was a little crazy kid. These were my, these guys were my heroes. Like, I was, this was just like if, if you were into sports, you know, and it was Michael Jordan or, or you know, right. anything like that. It's right. the same thing for me, the right. level of stardom or the pop stars to the kids now. These guys yeah. were like that to me, uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. And and I got to, and uh, it was great to, to meet these, and some of them were so sweet, you know, and so wonderful, you know, warm people. Like, there was a club in, in uh, Wilmington, Delaware called the Flight Deck, uh -huh. and and uh, that was where I, so I heard a lot of people for the first time. And when I was, like, 10 years old, we went there, it was the summer, we went to hear Jack McDuff. And uh, Jack McDuff and, and somebody, you know, a few people in the audience knew. I was kind of a little local, uh, you know, kid that everybody knew. Right, okay. and, you know, they knew about me. So Jack was finishing the gig, and somebody yelled out, Hey, Jack, you got to let this little guy play, you know. And he was gracious enough to let me up there to play. Really? Uh-huh. And I got into Rock Candy, one of his. Oh things. yeah, sure. I started playing that, you know, and it was it was unbelievable, you know. And then I went there to see Groove Holmes. Groove played a set. He came down. He saw this little kid sitting in front of the stage, you know, just loving every minute of it. So he couldn't help but come off the stage and want to know what's going on here. Right, right. right. A little guy digging everything. And so he came and sat with us and talked to us during his whole break, you know. And and, and then he said, "You want to play?" I was like, "Man, yeah." <laughs> was was that intimidating at all? Were you nervous? No, you know what? I don't know why. I guess I was too. I was too little. I was too naive. I, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I was nervous, but I wasn't intimidated. Uh -huh. you know? 
uh-huh. was like, I, I wanted to do it because these guys are my heroes. And I wanted to know how much I loved because, and I knew all of them. And I knew all their work. I knew each one of what their thing was. So Groove asked me to play, of course. I got up on the stage and I played Groove's Groove and I played Misty, you know. Okay, right, right. And, you know, so, and he was, and you know, these guys were so cool, you know. Jimmy Smith wasn't very cool in the beginning. Okay. You know, that that took time uh, yeah. for us to actually, to like, to the point where we were really cool with each other. Obviously, we wound up, you know, making right. his life very cool. Right. Uh-huh. You know, but he wasn't, uh, he was all right in the beginning, but it went, <laughs> you know, it just got, he wasn't as cool as these other guys were. And, you know, and then Charles Erwin, you know, was always a sweetheart. And I got to know all these guys. I knew Charles. He came in. There was a club I was playing in called Gert's Lounge in Philadelphia. And uh, he came in once. And I think I was around 11 years old. And I met him. And he came in, He came and sat in on my gig when I was 11 years old. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. And, uh, so... You know, Jimmy McGriff, same thing. First time I went to go see him play, you know, I told him I played the organ and this, that, and the other, and he had, he let me sit in. I mean, you know, these guys are, uh, were really wonderful, you know, and I look back on those times and I, I just so grateful for all of it. Right. I really got close with all the organ players. Don Patterson moved to Philly in 19, I think 1980. Maybe it was 81. He moved. He was living in Chicago. He's from Columbus, Ohio. Uh-huh. I think he was living in Chicago, and then he moved down to Philly. So I got to know him. You know, he was one of my still, all these guys are still very much heroes of mine. I still listen to their music. I mean, I have a radio show, too, now on XM Radio. Right, right. Uh-huh. I was going right. to talk about yeah, that. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I it's great because I... I've any things that I haven't listened to in a while. You know, I've had to go back and listen to a lot of stuff that I and I'm enjoying so much. Uh, you know, going back and hear a lot of the things that I haven't listened to in a while. So, you know, it's it's very cool. And I and I can put personalities after once you met these guys and spent some time in McGriff. We went all over the world. We were in Japan together. We did a lot of organ uh, summits together. Uh, three organs, too. One time really? it was me, McGriff, and uh, Lonnie Smith, Dr. Lonnie. Really? Uh-huh. And you we played together, together or just on the same bill? No, we played together. Okay, okay. Three organs together. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, that all, and I did that with Jimmy Smith. That was... That was I was like in my glory doing that. Too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. You, so. you, you know, uh, I I moved from Camden to Boston, and I started on the radio in 1969. I remember, uh, because I'd grown up in that area, in the Philly area, I had heard a lot of organ players on the radio. They used to play a lot of organ players on the radio. I remember sure. when I first started playing organ players on the radio, I used to get calls from people asking, what is with this organ? I still remember one call, caller said to me, man, this sounds like a roller, roller skating rink. And and I said to him, well, tell me the name of your roller skating rink, because that must be the hippest roller skating rink <laughs> in the world. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, saying that, I'm saying that to say uh, there are some people who say, who credit you with helping to bring about a, a revival of interest uh, in the organ. That was 1970 when I was getting those remarks. So mm-hmm. uh, do you think that's uh, true? Or do you think you had something to do with helping to create a revival? No, I, I, you know, I say it humbly, but there's no question okay. about that. Okay. Because my first record came out in uh, 1989, and it was on Columbia Records. It was a, a large label and a lot of publicity. And like you said, around 1970, 71, mid-70s, you know, the the whole genre kind of took a second, right. you know, second seat, man. I mean, you know, it was like... 
cats were still out on the road playing, but the the record companies weren't putting those type of records out, right? right. So the, it wasn't in the air, so it wasn't on the air. You know, not, some people were playing things on the radio, but there wasn't a lot of new releases. There went a long period of time where they're almost trying to make disco records and things. Right, right, guys. right. And I know it wasn't because they wanted to. It was because record companies, that's what they were allowing, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, So, you know, my record coming, luckily it had a hip uh, VP at, at Columbia Records, Dr. George Butler. Right. You know, and and he... He didn't even know I played the organ. I met him at the Thelonious Monk Piano Competition in 1988. Okay. Which I was one of the five finalists. Of. Right, right. Uh -huh. I guess that was 87. That was 87, yeah. So I was one of the five finalists, and I met him, and, you know, and he said, uh, send me a tape or whatever, you know. So, all right, I sent it. So I'm going to send a tape. What he didn't know is that I was really an organ player. That was where my heart was. Okay. Uh -huh. So when I sent him a tape, I went in the studio, made a demo, and I played organ on it. So I sent him the tape. But I, this is a great, fun story, you know. What, so I sent it. It was like December 22nd, 1987. I sent him his demo tape. Uh -huh. So we sent it, we called our office, they said, yeah, we received it, and and Mr. Butler said that he talked to you sometime after the first of the year, which I thought was, okay, right, we'll never hear from this guy. Because a lot of times they get, they don't even listen to Sure, them. sure, they sure. They into the garbage can, you know? Right. So, so, like I said, that was December 22nd. He called on Christmas Eve. I guess something made him listen to that recording called on Christmas Eve and said, I had no idea you played the organ. He, he just went crazy over, you know, this 16-year-old kid playing organ like that, uh -huh. you know, in that style, you know, of, of the, the, you know, the original style, the stuff of the cats. And he said, I want to sign you. And and that that's where it all started, you know, and that was where... <laughs> Uh, you know, next thing I knew, six months later, I was in the studio recording my first record. That was a great Christmas present, huh? <laughs> oh man, I was, you know, I was, I couldn't, I couldn't take it, man. Yeah, right, right, yeah. <laughs> so the record, the record, we recorded it in the summer of '88. It came out in the spring of '89, and they put, you know, this is a time when the record companies were really doing great, you know, because they, there wasn't the uh, the piracy that there is now. Right? right, right, right. So, you know, the whole different thing. I mean, the budgets, the, the publicity, all of that stuff. So it was right. So they got a lot of publicity, and a lot of people heard it, and it got a lot of airplay. And, you know, people really... There was a lot of people that thought this was something completely new that had never been done before. Really? Uh-huh. You know, and then they find out there's a history, because then I started doing interviews and things, and they went back and, and started checking out the guys from back, you know, the Jimmy the Griffs, Jimmy Smith, Jack McDuff, the doors, the, you know, because all of those records pretty much were out of print. Yeah, you're right, right, uh-huh. Right? Now... After my record, after a few years I was on the scene, all of those records got back in a circulation, and the cats started playing more again, and the organ, there's more interest. The or Hammond Organ Company started making an instrument. They were trying to make a digital version. You know, they're still striving to get that sound back, you know, to several different companies, you know, and... Uh, because that was the other thing. You, they didn't make ham and organs in that way anymore, right? Right, right. Uh -huh. And that sound was, so it just sparked all of that. And then all the original guys started coming out of woodwork again, and you had organ summits, festivals, record companies were re-signing. And then after, and then the first new guy 
after me was Larry Goldings, right? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Well, he, started, he was on the scene already playing piano and things, but then he got interested in the organ. So he started playing organ. So him and I were like the first guys. That, that, and then there were the people that then it just kept going on and on. And, and now... It's funny, you look at the, I remember when I first came out of the scene, it was pretty cool, and I first made the downbeat poles, right? Right, uh-huh. And the names that were on there were still all the hip. It was me, Jack McDuff, of course, Jimmy Smith. He won straight for 38 years. Yeah, that doesn't surprise um, me, right, right. Right, as, as, and that was correct. And, but, I mean, Jimmy McGriff, Jack McDuff, Groove Holmes, uh, Shirley Scott, everybody, and I was the last name on there. But I was on there with all those kids. Right. I was thrilled. Uh-huh. You, know? Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and and so they were. Uh, those cats were all still around. You know, at that time, so they started getting some work and doing things happening, and 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 that's. I'm so happy that that happened. I mean, I'm, I'm I feel completely honored that. You know that it was that I'm a big part of the reason why that happened. Right, uh-huh. and it's stronger than ever now. Now you look at the downbeat. But so a lot of these people left us. So then the polls started getting. You know, there wasn't as many new organ players listed. Now there's a whole bar now. Right, there definitely crazy. are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what's important. Yeah, yeah. No. There, there are a lot of records now, or CDs now, that come out with oh. organ players who, some are guys I wasn't familiar with before, but there are tons of records, uh, CDs coming out now with organ players on it. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Um, talk to me about uh, Miles Davis and uh, your association with uh, Miles and what that was like, too. Yeah, well, see, that's all interesting. All these things happen around the same time. So um, I actually met Miles the first time. There was a TV show in Philadelphia, and it was called Time Out. So they were going to have, they were having Miles on their show. It was a morning show to interview him, right? So they wanted to have some music on the show while he was there. So they got me. It was an all Philadelphia City uh, jazz trio, the kids, you know. So it was me, Christian McBride. Wow. And uh, the drummer's name was Stacy Dozer. And so we played, we played like commercial breaks and things like that. And then somebody got the bright idea of having four young trumpet players come out and play for Miles and have him critique them. Oh, really? Really? You know? uh-huh. So, <laughs> yeah. In fact, this is on YouTube, this whole show. No, it is. Oh, yep. okay. So, so, these cats played. So, there was one guy, that the last guy that played was a great trumpet player. His name was John Swano. Oh, I think I know of him, sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I play. I got one chorus on a blues that I played a solo on. And that one chorus of blues... Miles just, they were talking to him, and in the middle of the interview, he kind of just cut off what the guy was saying and went, what's your organ player's name? And that's the name of a tune on your new CD, too, right? That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's, that's tribute to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in the middle of the show, this guy, what's your organ player's name? Yeah, right. And, uh... And I got nervous. I mean, I froze because I said, is this guy going to destroy me in front of everybody <laughs> in my hometown? Right, yeah. You know, Miles Davis don't hold nothing back. We right. don't know this. Right, right. right. <laughs> so the guy said my name. He said it wrong. Joey DeFranco. I didn't even know that until I saw the show later. I was so nervous. Nothing else. I couldn't hear nothing. <laughs> so after the show, Miles punched me in the chest, told me, you could play. And he took my number. And then, uh, that was like October of 87. And then later that, you know, and then that was the same year I got the call to do, to, to sign with Columbia Records. And then my record was finished, uh, in the summer of 88. And then a 
Yes. In the summer of eight, like after I finished, I was on such a high, you know, that I was like coming down from it. it was like everything else. Was like, oh man, what's next? What's going to get better than that? Right, right, right. Uh-huh. And then the phone, I come home one day from hanging out with my friends. It was like August. And I came home, my grandmother says, uh, some man called here with a very raspy voice. His name was Miles Davis. <laughs> And I said, "Gal, yeah, I didn't believe it, dog. Like, whatever, because, you know, me and, and, and Chris McBride used to do this kind of stuff to each other all the time. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. So I went and got the the, uh, the number, and it was a 212 number, New York number. So I said, all right, let's see here. So I called, and sure enough, it was, and I hung up on him three times. Really? As soon as I heard his voice. He used to answer the phone like this. What? <laughs> That's how he the phone. Sounds like Miles, yeah. Yeah, yeah there was no hello. Was right. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, I hung up three times because I knew that that was him. I knew it was him. Uh-huh. And I just got so nervous. And so finally, the fourth time, you know, he said, he kept answering it. He said, who keeps hanging up on me? And I said, this is Joey. Hey, man, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> and he said, the first question was, you working with anybody? I mean, I'm 17 years old. Uh-huh. I'm just kidding. I said, uh, no. And he said, all right, can you come to New York today? I said, well, I can't come today because, you know, I'm in Philly. I didn't know what I was doing. Right. But I'll come tomorrow. And I went up there the next day, and I went up where he was living was at the Essex house. And uh, I went in there, and I went in this, and there he was, man. And I, and he hired me. He wanted me to play with his band. So did he make yeah. you audition before you played with him, or he just just? No, uh, I, I kind of I had the gig, but he just wanted he wanted he wanted, it, he wanted it, I guess he liked to do that stuff in person. Right. You know? Okay. Okay. You know, so I went, and he, yeah, when I got there, he had a Fender Rhodes there, and I sat down, and I started playing that, and he joined in and played a little bit of trumpet with me, with, so I, I thought I was on cloud nine. You know. <laughs> I'm sure. I was on cloud nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that was it, and he wanted to, he, he, he said, that's nice, nice touch, you know, and um, he, he liked me, and and he hired me, so I worked with him for six months. Okay, right. And, uh-huh. and and then I made the stupidest choice. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say that, but things went well. But I quit because the record company kind of put pressure on me to quit because, my, you know, at the same time, my new record came out. And they wanted me, they had all these promotional things. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. They yeah. all conflicted with the touring with Miles, you know. And he, I remember him calling... Uh, George Butler, how come you won't let Joey play with me? Yeah, he probably didn't uh, say it that clean, though. That, maybe not. You know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then finally, yeah, and then finally he accepted it. And the good thing is we remained very cool, very close, tight. So being around him is the reason why I wanted to play the trumpet. Okay, know? right. That's when I started playing trumpet. Well, you can hear the influence that Miles, Miles had on your trumpet playing. You can hear that. Oh, yeah, big yeah. time. Yeah. Big uh-huh. time. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's, you know, and he, listen, when I played with him, he was, he hired, Miles usually hired you because he liked what you did, so he didn't have too much to say about telling you to play this or play that because he already knew what you were doing, and that's why he hired you. So, but there were subtle things, you know. And uh, there were things mostly I learned from checking him out and listening to what he was doing and seeing how cool he was. And, you know, and the way he played and his choices and the chances he took and everything. You know, he was the greatest. Right. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Uh, before we close out, I want to talk to you a little bit about Organized. Tell me about Organized. Hmm. Yeah, so it's amazing that it'll be two years pretty soon here. Uh, Mark Ruffin from XM Radio, sure. uh-huh. he, uh, he approached us about, you know, they were already doing that show every Friday called Organized. And uh, he approached us about 
me taking it over and doing. He thought it would be really a good thing, and and so I said, "Wow, I, you know, I never did it. was a radio host, but I think I can." And I'm getting more. I'm enjoying it more and more all the time, and you know, and and I love it because I could play things that are out of. There's still a lot of uh, of stuff that's out of print, sure. uh-huh. more obscure things. So I could play those things, like, you know. I'm enjoying it, and and people are enjoying it, and people are hearing stuff. Like it's amazing to me when people say, "I never heard of this guy," or "I didn't know right. this guy." Right. You know what? <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, but for but I understand that because there's so much stuff, you know, and <clears throat> you know, and the organ always kind of, um, you know, for a lot of years, even even in its heyday. It wasn't. It didn't get an, as much respect from the real jazz that we call them the jazz police as it should have. You know, they kind of put it to the side and kind of put it more in. A, um, they call it soul jazz, which is silly because all jazz is soul jazz. <laughs> I, mean, I, I never. You know, first of all, labels, right? But <clears throat> you know, somebody like Jimmy Smith was such a genius and and he was on every level as much of a genius as a lot of the you know you know, they talk about John Coltrane who of course is is unbelievable and Miles Davis but Jimmy was was just as much a, 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 an innovator as they were okay uh-huh. you know and a lot of people I mean I think they're starting to realize it a little bit more now how important that was but you know, and then he had some hit records that were kind of like pop records at the time, right? Mojo. Right, right. And uh, High Heel Sneakers and things, which all that stuff was great, too. But I think it took away the, some of the respect from those the, the critics, you know. Right, uh-huh. That forgot about, well, this cat in Small's Paradise in 1957 was playing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know? uh-huh. He was very experimental. He was very harmonically sophisticated. He was playing. If you listen to those those live records from the fifties, he was playing some things that maybe Coltrane hadn't gotten to yet. Right, right. So you know what I mean. The, the, the awareness of that is, is wasn't there, and it's it's almost it's starting to get there now, and that's because I'm really doing my damnness to make people aware of it. Yeah. You know? uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, uh, just a, a reminder to folks again that the new CD is called Trip Mode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have anything to say about the the new one? Yeah, I, you know, uh, I was very excited to make this record, and and I wrote a, most of the songs on there are original. The guitarist has one original tune on there, um, and I think there's other than that, there's one standard "Touch of Your Lips." That's the one I sing on. Right. Um, but it was a lot of fun. These guys, I love playing with these guys. It's been, uh, when we made the record, we were together for five months. But now we've been together exactly a year. In fact, when we played in, uh, in Boston, we had just been together for a couple of weeks, that group. Oh, okay. And, uh, it just keeps developing and developing. And when we went in the studio, I decided to, uh, you know, make these you know play some piano and play some trumpet not that i hadn't already done that on some other records but uh these the approach of these musicians um this is the first time you know i had musicians in the band that weren't you know usually everybody was older than me now it's starting to get into the the other way (laughs) right you're right right yeah that does happen that does happen We're close in age, but you know it's fun. The guitar player is thirty-one. I'm, I'm, I'll be forty-five. So you know, there's an age difference that that it was. It's, it's funny, you know. It's, it's when that starts to happen. Right, you know, right. Cool. It's good too because they got ideas and things, and 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 you know, everybody opens up each other's minds to do different things, and we and we were able to. Uh, a lot of that is, was able to come across on on the uh, on the record trip mode so I love the sound of the record too I think the, the recording quality of all the instruments really came out nice real clear and very articulate and um, yeah it's a musical trip you know that's the hence its title okay uh-huh. you know it's not 
you know, primarily it's straight ahead jazz, but there's, you know, like that what's your organ player's name, which is a tribute to Miles saying that. Right. And it is is a, a little more funky thing, kind of in the style of what we were doing when I was playing with Okay, I, right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, uh-huh. and, um, and there's like a New Orleans kind of thing on there, on Traffic Jam's got a little James Brown vibe. You know, but there's always, there's a slow blues uh, on there, but there's the straight ahead stuff. You know, it's all, to me, that's all one thing anyway. I, I, it, to to chop them up, it's improvised, it's music that's, you know, it's improvised music. Right, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, mm-hmm. I, this is something I should have asked you about a second ago, and I didn't. When is organized on the air? Organize is on uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Friday. Okay, okay, great, great. Uh, Jelly, man, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed talking with you. I think we covered a lot of ground. Yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Okay. All right. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, man. I'll talk to you later. Okay, Bye-bye. take care. Uh-huh.